Hi, this is Maggie. In this video, we're going to review the processes of desk checking and debugging, but for programs that include loops. This video will assume that you already know how to desk check and how to use the idle debugger. So if those tools are unfamiliar to you, you should review the sections of the textbook that go through them, or review prior desk checking and debugging videos. Before we get started, I'm going to quickly give you some tips for how to get the most out of this video. First, if you have problem solving with Python, read up through chapter 4. If you don't have it, you can still learn a lot from this video. Open up Idle and follow along with Python as I work. Sometimes I'm going to suggest you pause the video and complete some steps on your own. When I do that, pause the video and do your best to complete the steps on your own. The way to learn to program is by programming. You can watch and learn if you work along with me. Remember, you can always pause the video and try something, or go back and watch again. You don't have to wait for me to tell you to pause. There are some automated exercises in the description of this video. The exercises work with the same code or similar code to the code in the videos. After you've completed the video, try the exercises to cement the concepts in your mind. Now let's get started. I'm going to start with debugging a program with a while loop. We'll then look at a for loop, and then we'll desk check the same programs, showing that desk checking mirrors the flow of control, or order of execution, that is revealed to us when we use the debugger. We will debug this program, loopdebug.py, which contains a sentinel controlled loop that obtains names from the user through console input. It finds the name that is alphabetically first, and it computes the average length of the names. The variable first is a most wanted holder, which will hold the best fit name at any given point during program execution. So the name that is alphabetically first so far. And the variable total length will accumulate the lengths of the names. The variable count will count the number of names entered so we can average the lengths. To set up debugging, we should arrange our windows so we can see the code, the console, and the debugging window. To start debugging, choose Debugger from the Debug menu in the console. The Debug Control window appears. I recommend checking the Source box in the window. Stack and Locals should already be checked by default. Checking the Source box will ensure the debugger shows us the line of code that is currently executing. We could use the debugger to step through our program from start to finish, but that isn't usually how a debugger is used. We're usually looking for an error in the program, and so we set a breakpoint at some point before we believe the error is occurring. Let's set a breakpoint at the line while not done in name, which is the beginning of our loop. We will step through the loop because that's the focus of this video. To set a breakpoint, right click on the line and choose Set Breakpoint from the context-sensitive menu that appears. So if we then run our program, we choose Run Run Module, and the line that's currently executing will be highlighted in the source code window. It is also shown in the area in the middle of the debugging window. To get to our breakpoint, we can then click the Go button. Because there's a console input before the breakpoint, I'll have to type a name in at the prompt. I'm going to type the word zebra and press enter. Now the program executes to the breakpoint and stops. And I can see that the header line of the loop is highlighted. And I can see in the locals area of the window that the variable first has the value zebra, the variable name has the value zebra, and the variables count and total length both have the values zero. I can choose the over button to step over each line of code and see how the values in the variables change as the program executes. What a debugger allows us to do is view the actual flow of control of our program and view the state of the program, the values in the variables, after each line has executed. We use a debugger to find where our assumptions about how the program is working are wrong. We expect to go into the loop because we didn't type done, and we don't expect first to be replaced with name because they are the same, and we will expect the length of zebra, 5, 
to be added to total length, and will expect count to increment to 1. So I will click the Over button. and I find the variables change as expected, and the last line in the loop is the updater, which will have me enter another name or done. This time I'll enter Flamingo. And notice that we go back up to the loop entry condition. This is how loops work. Once execution reaches the bottom of the loop, execution always returns to the top of the loop to check the condition again. So that loop entry condition always executes one more time than the number of times the loop body executes. So we'll go through again and confirm that the values in the variables match our expectations, or if there's a bug, hopefully find where our assumptions are wrong. So now count is 2, total length is 13, and Flamingo is our alphabetically first name. Now I'll type done at the prompt. And we go back up to the top of the loop. Execution always returns to the loop entry condition after the bottom of the loop. But now the word done is contained in what I entered for name. So when I click the over button, we jump to the first line after the loop and step through this if statement. Count is greater than zero. So the program reports that Flamingo is the name that was alphabetically first of the names entered, and the average length of the names was 6.5. When you find your bug, you can click the Go button or the Quit button to quickly jump out of the program. You don't have to continue debugging. Let's debug a program with a for loop now. This is a very simple program called forloopdebug.py that uses a for loop to obtain three integers from the user. The input is stored in a variable called num. There is an accumulator variable called total that sums the values entered. After obtaining three values, the program reports the sum. We will set a breakpoint on the first line of the loop and run the program. When the debugger comes up, we choose Go, and the program stops on our breakpoint, the header line of the for loop. We can see that the variable total has the value 0. When we click over, the loop control variable i takes the value 0. The program then prompts for a value. I'll enter 10. If I click over again, it adds 10 to the total, so both num and total have the value 10. We return to the header line of the loop, just as with a while loop. We'll step through two more times by clicking the over button, and I'll enter 10 each time. Notice that i takes on the values 1 and 2. These are the values in range 3, and i takes on each one once for each iteration of the loop. Notice the debugger jumps back to the loop header one last time, but the range is out of values, so execution proceeds past the loop body, and the program reports the sum of the totals. Now that we've debugged these two programs, let's desk check them, beginning with the program with the while loop. When desk checking a loop, we will create a table with a column for the line number, a column for each variable, columns for input and output, and then it is often helpful to include lines for tests, such as the loop entry condition, and in the case of our program, the if conditions name.upper less than first.upper and count greater than zero. This gives us 10 columns for this program. You can include any columns that help you play the role of the Python interpreter in executing the program. We will also need to number the lines of our program. I'm going to open the program in Notepad++, which has line numbers to the left of the lines of code. 
Notice that it colors the syntax a little differently from idle. Okay, so we execute the program as if we were the Python interpreter. The default flow of control is sequential flow of control, so lines of code executing sequentially or in sequence from the top of the file to the bottom. The first six lines are docstring and comments, which we can ignore. We then have two variable annotations on lines 7 and 8, which we can also ignore, as variable annotations are documentation to Python. On lines 9 and 10, we have assignment statements, assigning 0 to total length and 0 to count. So in my desk checking table, I'll put rows for lines 9 and 10, and on the row for line 9, I'll put a 0 in the total length column, and in the row for line 10, I'll include that same 0 and an additional 0 in the column for count. On line 13, we obtain a name from the console. And on line 14, we assign that string to the variable first. So with desk checking, as with debugging, we are going to run the program on a particular set of inputs. Let's desk check a program in which we enter wombat at the first prompt. And I've decided the names are going to be animals, in case you hadn't noticed. And so on line 13, we'll have wombat in name and in the input column. And on line 14, we'll have wombat in first. And now we get to the interesting part, the start of the loop. This is where the flow of control changes from sequential to a looping flow of control because of the keyword while, meaning that once we're finished executing the loop body, we will always return to the loop header, the first line of the loop. In our example, this is line 17. And we look at the loop entry condition, not done in name. and done is not in name, so that evaluates to true. Which means we enter the loop and we put true in our condition on line 17 on the desk checking table. And because the condition is true, we go into the loop body. Flow of control is sequential, so we execute the first line of code in the loop, line 18, which happens to be a branching or if statement. So where we go next will depend on the truth value of the condition name.upper less than first.upper. Now we can see that these strings are the same and will be the same if converted to uppercase. So that is false. And we skip the conditional line, line 19. We put false in that column in our desk checking table. So we jump to the first line of code after the conditional code, line 20, which adds the length of the string name to the variable total length. The length of the name, which is wombat, is 6. And total length currently holds 0. So 0 plus 6 is 6. And we'll put 6 in the total length column for line 20. And then we reach line 21, which increments count count was 0, and now after line 21 executes, it's 1. And now a very important line of code in a loop, the updater. Without line 22, our loop would be infinite, provided we entered it to begin with. On line 22, we obtain another input from the user. Let's make it quaka, which is such a cute little marsupial, or at least they look cute in pictures. So on line 22, the input is quaka, and that's stored in the variable name. And what line executes next? If you answered line 17, you are correct. After the last line of the loop body executes, execution always returns to the top of the loop to check the condition and determine whether we go through the loop again. So we go to line 17 and test not done in name, and that condition evaluates to true because name is quaka, and so we go into the loop body again and execute line 18. Line 18 is an if statement with the test name.upper less than first.upper, and that is going to evaluate to true because quaka is lexicographically before wombat. 
So we execute the conditional line, line 19. On line 19, we set first equal to name. So first becomes quaka. Okay, and then we execute line 20, total length plus equals len name. Quaka has six characters in it, and total length has six in it, so six plus six is 12, and we store that in total length on line 20. And then we execute line 21, count plus equals one. The variable count has a value of one in it, so we add one to that, and we get two for count on line 21. And now we reach line 22, our updater, and prompt the user for another name. Let's type done to get out of this loop. So on line 22, done is our input, and done is read into the variable name. By the way, I should probably be putting prompts in the output column, but they're so long, I'll put an asterisk on the prompt lines, lines 13 and 22, and just below the table, please enter a name or type done when finished. Okay, so what line executes next? If you said line 17, you are correct. Remember, when we desk check, we're playing Python interpreter. The interpreter will always go to the loop entry condition after the loop body has executed. We need to play the dumb computer and not the smart programmer. That's how we find bugs that the smart programmer wrote into the program. So we go back up to line 17 and execute the test, not done in name, and now it's false. So we do not enter the loop. What line do we go to? We go to the first line after the loop body, line 25. This line also contains a test. Count greater than zero, which evaluates to true as count is two. So we execute the conditional code on lines 26 through 29. On lines 26 and 27, there is a print statement. So there is output. The name that is alphabetically first is, and the value in first, which is quaka. And on lines 28 and 29, another print statement. The average length of the names entered is, and then total length divided by count. Total length is 12, and count is 2, and that is formatted to two decimal places, so 6.00. Now, one thing that's interesting about a desk checking table is that you can see the variable roll patterns if you look at variables changing over time. We only desk checked this for two full iterations of the loop, so the patterns aren't quite as obvious as if we'd continued to enter data, but you can do that on your own. You can see that count is a stepper variable, which means it's taking on a predictable sequence of values. It's 0 and then increments to 1 on line 21, and then increments to 2 again on line 21, and would continue to do so if we hadn't ended the loop. There's an accumulator, total length, sometimes also called a gatherer, which accumulates the length of the strings entered by the user into itself. When the loop is done executing, it contains the total length of all strings added together. There's the most recent holder, name, which contains the value entered by the user. A most recent holder can hold the next value in any input stream, a value entered by the user, or a value in a file, or in the future we'll see it can also iterate over data in memory stored in a list. And the most wanted holder, first, holds the value that is the best fit so far in the input stream for some criteria. In this case, it is the lexicographically earliest value. Now let's turn to desk checking the for loop program. Once again, I'll open the file in Notepad++ so we can see line numbers, and I'll create a desk checking table with columns for the line numbers, our variables, inputs, and outputs. There are no explicit tests in this program. And so again, execution begins sequentially, and the first line that is not documentation is line 7, in which the variable total gets the value 0. We then proceed sequentially to the first line of the for loop on line 10 for i in range 3. So how do we desk check a for loop? 
For loops are very similar to while loops. Execution begins at the loop header and returns to the loop header after the loop body has executed. But there's no condition determining whether we go into the loop. We go into the loop once for each value in the range. So range 3 is the value 0, 1, and 2. The variable after the keyword 4, i, will take the value 0 first, and we will go through the loop body, then return to the loop header. Let's do that. The variable i takes the value 0 on line 10, and we go into the loop. On line 11, we get a value from the user. Let's have the user input 5, which gets stored in num. On line 12, we add that number to what's already in total. So 0 plus 5 is equal to 5, which is stored in total. And now where does the flow of control bring us? Back up to line 10. Now I will take on the next value in the range, which is 1, and we go back into the loop. On line 11, we get another value from the user, so let's have the user enter 10, which gets stored in the variable num. On line 12, we add that to the value already in total, so 5 plus 10 equals 15, which is stored back in total. And where do we go next? Back up to the top of the loop, where i takes on the next value in range 3, which is 2, and we go back into the loop. We get another value from the user on line 11. Let's have the user enter 15, which is stored in num. And then on line 12, it's added to the value already in total, giving us 30 stored back into total. And where do we go now? Back up to the top of the loop on line 10. But this time, there are no values left in range 3. So we do not proceed into the loop body. We proceed to the first executable line of code after the loop body, line 15, which is an output statement. So our program prints the total of your values is, and then the value stored in total, which we can see is 30. When we desk check a for loop, just as with a while loop, you can see the patterns that variable roles make in the desk checking table. In this program, we have an accumulator or gatherer total, a most recent holder num, and a stepper i. That is desk checking and running the debugger on programs with for loops and while loops, including loops that have variables in stepper, most recent holder, most wanted holder, and accumulator roles. I recommend that you try desk checking these programs again with the same values that we used, and then try again with different values, and compare with executing the program in the debugger. It's very important to learn to read code, and part of reading code is understanding the flow of control. A debugger is an enormous help in understanding flow of control, and an even bigger help in finding bugs in your program that have resulted from incorrect assumptions about the program's state and flow of control, given a particular set of inputs.